session of the 64th Wyoming Legislature's General Session will please come to order. Senator Perkins and Representatives Miller and Burkhart, the U.S. Court, the First Lady of Wyoming, Carol Meade, her children, Mary and Pete, and His Excellency, the Governor, Matthew H. Meade, for this joint session. The body will stand at ease until the time of the gavel. Go ahead, guys. Go get them. Joint session will now come to order. All rise. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, it is my pleasure to announce the following guests. The Honorable Nancy Friedenthal, Chief Judge, United States District Court for the District of Wyoming, escorted by Senator Rothquist and Representatives Hallinan and McGuire. Honorable William Hill, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Case and Representatives Cork and Nicholas. Honorable Michael Davis, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Barnard and Representatives Paxton and Steinmetz. Kate Fox, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Landon and Representatives Madden and Connolly. Honorable Keith Couch, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Burns and Representative Salazar and McKim. The Honorable Jillian Balow, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, escorted by Senator Coe and Representative Summers and Northrop. Honorable Mark Gordon, State Treasurer, escorted by Senator Meyer and Representatives Claussen and Lloyd Larson. The Honorable 
Honorable Cynthia Cloud, State Auditor, as ordered by Senator Peterson and Representatives Hunt and Byrd. The Honorable Ed Murray, Secretary of State, escorted by Senator Von Flateren and Representatives Crank and Loan. James Burke, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Wyoming, escorted by Senator Christensen and Representatives Greer and Beitman. First Lady of Wyoming, Carol Mead, and His Excellency, the Governor of the State of Wyoming, Matthew H. Mead, escorted by Senator Perkins and Representatives Miller and Burkhart. I would like to invite Father Cronkleton to please give the invocation. And would all of you please remain standing for this invocation. Let us pray. Lord God, creator of all that is, you made humanity in your image and likeness and gave us dominion over all you have made. We give our consent that some of our dominion that you have given us is to be exercised over us by the men and women we elect and choose to govern us. Be with, therefore, our senators, our representatives, our elected officials, the members of the judiciary, and the personnel who assist them so that they may be good stewards of what we and you have entrusted to them. This 64th Wyoming legislature in its general session 
faces many daunting challenges as they address the financial, educational, and other needs of our great state. Give these men and women wisdom, prudence, insight, and creativity, particularly when they face hard decisions during this session. Help them to work together for the common good of the people of this great state of Wyoming, and let them have a special concern for the poor and the most disadvantaged in our land. As we now listen to Governor Meade share with us the state of the state, and Chief Justice Burke share with us the state of the judiciary, let us ponder together the challenges and the opportunities before us, so that with your divine grace and assistance, we may together fulfill the responsibility to govern well. We ask this in all things in your holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Members of the 64th Legislature, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a privilege for Steve and I up here, the Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, to introduce His Excellency, the Governor of the great state of Wyoming, the Honorable Matthew H. Meade. Governor, here, use mine. <laughs> Governor, once again, I'm helping you out. Here's mine. conclusion <laughs> should never say that never say that mr. president mr. speaker mr. members of the 64th legislature secretary Murray Roddy McLeod treasurer Borden superintendent Balo chief justice Burke members of the judiciary members of the military veterans citizens of Wyoming Paul Mary, Pete, glad to have you here as always. As you probably noticed uh, walking in, I am quickly becoming the shortest member of my family, and there's nothing to be done about it, but always proud to have my family here. Good morning to all of you. I'm privileged today to give my seventh State of the State address to the joint session of this new legislature, Wyoming 64. There are new leaders and new faces. There is a new energy that comes with adding new people to the mix. To first-time legislators, welcome. You, are jo you have joined a very distinguished group. To returning legislators, welcome back. As always, I look forward to working with this body on the important work of the head. State of the State. On the State of the State, I'm pleased to report that though we face challenging times, Wyoming remains strong. Our state has prepared well for times of lower revenue, 
and our citizens continue to do great things, contributing to Wyoming's strength and success. Preparation for Lunar Times has two hallmarks, conservative budgeting and saving. Past and present leaders have wisely done both. Regarding savings, the state has $1.59 billion in the LSRA, the Rainy Day Fund, and nearly $7.4 billion in the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund. These funds have grown substantially during my time in office. The Rainy Day Fund, of course, is named for rainy days, like those we've been experiencing these last couple of years, rain. This fund has allowed us to get through a rough revenue cycle and can do so in the future. Last session, our spending from Rainy Day Fund helped smooth our budget and provide necessary services. Questions, however, remain about the Rainy Day Fund and its use and continue to exist. I continue to believe we need additional guidelines on the use of this fund that will set parameters and provide our citizens and local government with better opportunities to refine their budgets by knowing what is the Rainy Day Fund for and when will it be used. Certainly, we know that the cautious use of some rainy day funds allow us to fill the revenue gap in tough financial times. For example, the 1718 biennium, this body tapped 221 million from the LSRA for use, leaving the fund healthy. This was important to do because it continued to make Wyoming stronger. But because we see, despite the energy bust, which has gone on for about three years now, Wyoming has kept high national rankings. These are indicative of our state's strength. For example, Wyoming has maintained the AAA credit ratings and standards and scores. In 2016, Wyoming was ranked the best state to start a business, the best state to make a living, and the best state to retire. That's in 2016, that difficult year that we just went through. Wyoming continues to be ranked number one in the having the most business-friendly tax plan. In 2016, Wyoming was ranked first in Mountain Region for workforce development and was also rated third for new business startup activity and sixth best state for business. So despite being the most difficult budget year in my time in office, Wyoming stayed proactive and forward-looking. The capital construction project with the important work of renovating and modernizing our state facilities, like the Wyoming State Hospital, the Wyoming Life Resources, and the Wyoming Veterans Home. We had groundbreaking at the University of Wyoming for the McMurray High Altitude Performance Center and the Engineering Education Research Building last fall, and groundbreaking for the Integrated Test Center last spring. University of Wyoming, in addition to new facility starts, we opened the NG STEM facility in March 2016, and the High Bay Research Facility is opening soon. We have had incredible opportunities with the wealth created by our many businesses and great citizens. We're grateful for so many partnerships. We're grateful for the partnerships we have with the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes. We are partners and friends to each other and I look forward to continued good relations with the tribe. Sergio Maldano, tribal liaison for the Northern Arapaho tribe is here today. Leslie Shakespeare of Eastern Shoshone is also here. Leslie has kindly agreed to continue as a tribal liaison in her informal capacity until a new person is chosen. We appreciate the work of those liaisons which strengthen ties and improve communication. If the tribal members, all tribal members that are here and liaisons would please stand would like to welcome you to the State of the State. None of the prosperity we have enjoyed would be fully realized without the safety and security provided by our law enforcement and first responders. I know we see nationally sometimes uh, law enforcement is put in corners with a broad bat and a broad brush, and we often uh, vilify them. In Wyoming, we don't do that. We continue to be extremely proud of our law enforcement and first responders. 
crime Wyoming, as we continually do, to once again make law enforcement the first priority. Have a great day. We know firsthand, and we would not have our Wyoming quality of life without the men and women who serve in the Guard. Our Guard helps fight the global war on terrorism and assists here at home where, with firefighting, flood control, and storm damage. Last year, our Guard performed air medical eva evacuation missions in Afghanistan, helped fight wildfires in Idaho, filled sandbags in Saratoga and Hudson, helped prevent a wildfire in the Bighorn Mountains from becoming a much larger wildfire. That's just a few of the things the Guard did in one year. General Luke Reiner, the Adjutant General of Wyoming, is here today representing the Guard. Thank you, General. We are grateful for your service and the service of all Guard members. General, please stand so you may be recognized. It's great to have you here, and as always, you look very sharp in that uniform, sir, so thank you for being here. As we celebrate our Guard members, we remain grateful for all military members, our veterans and those who serve our veterans. I've asked today for two distinguished veterans to be here with us, Lee Alley and Larry Bartleford. Lee is vice chairman of the Wyoming Veterans Commission, and Larry is the director. Both, unfortunately, have indicated they're going to be retiring early in 2017. Lee is a Wyoming native and graduate of the University of Wyoming. In 1967, he went to Vietnam as an Army lieutenant and served as a reconnaissance platoon leader for an infantry battalion. His list of military decorations include the Distinguished Service Cross, the Soldier's Medal, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, two Air Medals, two Purple Hearts, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. He was nominated for our nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. Upon his return from Vietnam, to Vietnam, the Casper Star hailed Lee as Wyoming's Audie Murphy, alluding to the highly decorated World War II vet. Lee was instrumental in helping reshape the Wyoming Veterans Commission so that it serves all generations of our veterans. His leadership ensured the Commission's work is professional and relevant. He previously served as chairman of the Commission and served 10 years in all. Lee's book, Back from War, A Quest of Life After Death, has been used by countless vets and their families to better understand how they can adjust to life after serving in combat. Colonel Bartleboard took the oath of an Army ROTC scholarship cadet in 1975. His military and government service spanning more than 40 years began then. He served on active duty with the 4th Infantry Division for five years, was selected for the active guard and reserve program for the Wyoming Army Guard in 1985 and retired in 2000. He was recalled to active duty in 2000 serving as Wyoming Army Guard Chief of Staff and was responsible for airport security augmentation for 10 Wyoming airports following the 9-11 attacks. He retired from the Army again in 2004, became director of the Wyoming Veterans Commission in 2007, and since, the, since then has worked tirelessly to improve benefits, services, and programs for Wyoming veterans. In my budget message, I discuss one benefit, the Veterans Tuition Waiver, which suffered from last year's session cuts. To address the issue in the interim, I moved money to fix the program during the interim period, but it's just a short-term fix. I favor a long-term commitment to those who join the Guard when the promise of tuition assistance was in place. I also favor some form of support for new recruits. I hope you'll favorably consider these matters. We, and I mean our state, are nearly 50,000 vets and all those who work with the Commission, including me, will miss Larry and Lee. Our communities, our state, our country are better places because of men like Larry and Lee, who step up to serve in the U.S. military and keep on serving in a civilian capacity. With their work and the outstanding work of this Wyoming legislature, 
Wyoming is recognized as one of the very best states for veterans to retire in. Larry Lee, we couldn't thank you enough for all the service you provided to state and country. Please stand so we can recognize both of you. Thank you. Here in Wyoming, we are enriched by our great ag, tourism, and of course, minerals. We know for those industries to remain strong, we need the University of Wyoming to be great. A great university starts with great leadership. And we have a great leader in Lori Nichols, UW's 26th president. She started in May 2016 when Dick McGinnity retired. She came at a challenging time. It's hard enough to be a university president, let alone during a time of budget cuts. It's great to have her at the helm. We are proud of the new facilities at the University of Wyoming, which will strengthen Wyoming's reputation as a leader in education, technology, and innovation. We are proud of the academic research and athletic achievements at UW. Speaking of which, how about that Cowboy football team? They gave us some great memories, and we appreciate that. And Laura, we thank you for your leadership at a critical time, and thank you for being here today. Please stand so we may recognize you in the University of Wyoming. We are keeping the competitive edge, and that's a wise thing to do at all times, especially during a time of constrained revenue. In 2016, we pressed on with efforts to promote and diversify our economy. I'll give a few examples. We are now and shall always be a proud ag state. Ag puts food on the table. Ag provides great open spaces. We have great wildlife in Wyoming. We have great respect for the Second Amendment. And when you combine all these assets together, it's no surprise that hunting, firearms, and shooting sports are part of Wyoming's history and heritage. We want to keep these traditions and pass them on to future generations. And we want to share our enjoyment of sporting life with others. With this in mind, I announced a new initiative for public shooting ranges and shooting competitions, including the first annual Magpool-sponsored Governor's Match scheduled for this summer. A charged state parks with convening an outdoor recreation task force. The task force held its first meeting in December and will provide recommendations to me this year on how to further expand the growing outdoor industry. Thanks to Atlas Carbon, Tungsten, Hi-Viz, and McGinley Orthopedics going gangbusters, 2016 was a year of expansion for manufacturing. The Wyoming firearm arms industry, an important component of manufacturing, continues to grow. Our world-class companies manufacture handguns, precision rifles, silencers, optics, sights, and other firearms accessories. Take, for example, Magpul, recently selected by the United States Marines as the exclusive supplier of magazines for combat use. Isn't that incredible news for a Wyoming company to supply our U.S. Marines? Now, while there were doubters about recruitment of firearm companies, I believe now more than ever, we can continue to build on a robust firearms industry in Wyoming. You all are aware of my focus on the technology sector. With a unified network, annual broadband and global technology summits, recruiting efforts and natural advantages like the cool climate, energy availability, technology continues to emerge as a viable economic sector. I truly believe it can be our fourth largest se sector and we must continue to, to build upon it. 
last spring with more than three quarters of the initiatives the original energy strategy complete we updated the strategy to include eleven new initiatives amongst those initiatives were working to take make changes the endangered species act the endangered species act was passed in one nine hundred seventy three since one nine hundred seventy three all the species listed a little over just one percent have ever been delisted it needs help as chairman of the western government association my initiative was to get the western states on board to change and improve the endangered species act and as you can be aware all western states don't have the same politics as wyoming well we worked together with outdoor groups with environmental groups we put together a pro proposal and i'm pleased to say in june last year Western governors voted unanimously for improvements to the Endangered Species Act. We're now to going to take it through the National Government Association, and we're going to take it to Congress. It's time to make improvements to the Endangered Species Act. <laughs> we continue with the energy strategy with review of reclamation rules, carbon innovation, and I greatly appreciate the legislature's support of the energy strategy which has helped with implementation. We not only want to be the energy state in terms of production, we want to be the energy state in terms of innovation, and we can be. The Carbon Initiative looks at building an industry around CO2. This means investing in advanced energy technologies and innovation. The Integrated Test Center, under construction now at the Dry Fork Station in Gillette, is part of this effort. The relationship we fostered with the XPRIZE has now put together a $10 million prize for the team that can figure out how to capture that CO2 and not only capture it, but to use it to make a useful product. This has not only brought attention in Wyoming to how we help further coal, but around the country. The governor of Montana is asking his legislature to help participate in this. We have companies coming to Wyoming to learn what they can do to participate in it. It's very exciting, it's very important to be have that innovation here in Wyoming. An industrial park project for value-added energy products, that is, uses beyond extraction, is also part of the carbon initiative. In 2014, this body appropriated $15 million for the ITC and provided seed money to begin an energy-related industrial park project. Projects like these not only help Wyoming's number one industry, minerals, especially coal, they foster diversification. The ITC is well on its way, and we need to pursue the industrial park project this year. I hope you'll consider a bill that provides for further, further implementation of the initiatives in the energy strategy. We are proud that Wyoming is the energy state, and we are the energy state. In 2016, as part of that, we continue to implement that which goes with energy, which is water. The state water strategy was issued two years ago. The water strategy contains 10 initiatives. One of the initiatives is the 10 and 10 project, which seeks to build 10 new reservoirs in 10 years. While I know it's ambitious, we've come a long ways, and I'm pleased to say the omnibus water bill you'll consider this session has four of these 10 and 10 projects. The Big Sandy Reservoir enlargement in Sublet and Sweetwater counties the Middle Piney Reservoir in Sublet County, the Alkali Re Creek Reservoir in Bighorn County, the Levitt Reservoir expansion in Bighorn County. Water projects like these are funded separately from government operations, education, and school construction and maintenance. These funds generally come from Water Account 3, which has accumulated over the years and has the funding available. Together, these projects would add over 31,000 acre feet of storage of our most precious natural resource, that is water. Water is key to economic development, ag production, and more, and water development must remain a priority. In 2016, the executive branch, we continue to streamline our rules and tighten our belts. For example, we put uniform rules in place for public record requests. This is in addition to my request two years ago to have all agencies reduce their rules by 30%. We have fewer rules, we are spending less, and we're down positions from fiscal year 2011, my first year in office. We have in Wyoming bucked the trend of so many governments that only grow. While being careful with a budget is critical, we can never forget we are more than counters of dollars. We are here for the citizens of Wyoming. 
To be sure, we must remain aware of our inmate population, our disabled population, the health care we are providing or not providing to the citizens of Wyoming. And always, we think of our families and the next generation, our children. In September, I sponsored the Governor's Symposium on Suicide Prevention in Casper. It's important to talk about suicide and ways to reduce suicide. People who are hurting need help, and we need to look for ways how we can better provide it. This will now become an annual symposium. In November, I announced the Endow Initiative at the Business Forum. This is a long-term planning effort for economic diversification. The acronym stands for Economically Needed Diversification Options for Wyoming. I seek $2.5 million for this initiative in my supplemental budget proposal. I'll continue to work for economic diversification, building on our successes during my last two years in office. However, as a state, we need a plan that goes beyond one governor's time in office. We need a 20-year plan. And we do not diversify to displace energy, tourism, and ag. We diversify to increase our economic opportunities in those areas as well to expand our economic base overall. As we diversify our industries, we must look at how we tax our industries. Diversification and a broad-based fair tax structure are required to stabilize our economy, our revenue. We need to diversify not only to stabilize and grow our revenue, but equally important as that, as equally important to that, is we need to diversify to benefit our young people. We need to provide more options for our young people, to give them as many reasons as possible to say yes to staying in Wyoming as we can. As we look at our population, we know that in a, any given time period, we lose between about 60% of the age group between 18 and 25. Our future will never be as bright as it, it can be if we don't do all we can to keep young people home, home in Wyoming. The energy. <laughs> the energy bust and the revenue fallout from it reminds us why the Endow Initiative is imperative. I want to thank President Bebout and Speaker Harshman for their leadership on moving Endow forward. In December, we got some great news. The National Park Service completed the purchase of the 640-acre flats, uh, Antelope Flats parcel of state trust land located within Grand Teton National Park for $46 million. $23 million came from the federal government, and $23 million came from over 5,000 private donations to the Grand Teton National Park Foundation. I thank all the donors who made this happen, the legislature for its support, and of course we remember the late U.S. Senator Craig Thomas who got the ball rolling on this. Not only is this a good news for the park, it's good news for education funding at a time when we need good news. The money has been deposited in the common school trust fund to support Wyoming schools. The parcel was generating no revenue for Wyoming. We were getting zero dollars from that parcel. Income generated in the common school trust fund account varies, but it expected that these funds will generate more than a million dollars annually for our schools. The funds are also available for the Board of Land Commissioners to acquire land assets held by the federal government if we choose to do so. The state of Wyoming currently owns one remaining 640-acre parcel in the park, the Kelly Parcel on the Grovant Road. It's valued at $46 million. We are making money on that parcel. That $46 million asset is bringing us in a whopping about $2,000 a year. The legislative authorization for the direct sale of the Kelly Parcel expired December 31, 2016. Moving forward, the Board of Land Commissioners has authority to exchange the parcel or sell it at auction to the highest bidder. Additional authorization, authorization however, from the legislature will be required for a direct sale to the National Park Service, and this is something I ask you to consider. The bottom line is, even during these tough times, we accomplished a lot in 2016, and Wyoming remains strong heading into this new year, and that's a big achievement. For keeping our state strong during a difficult period, there's a lot of credit to go around. 
certainly the legislature, the University of Wyoming, our amazing community colleges, our state agencies, and in our communities, our schools, and our businesses. And as I've said before, Wyoming, people's, Wyoming people are Wyoming's greatest asset. The individuals I recognize today are an example of people all around Wyoming who contribute to our state's strength, and we thank all of them. Now I turn to the budget. In June 2016, I asked agencies to implement $250 million in cuts from the 17-18 budget. This was in response <coughs> to a larger revenue shortfall forecast in the spring. These were difficult but necessary cuts. My supplemental budget proposal carries these cuts forward, making them permanent. With my cuts and the legislature's cuts last session, the executive branch operating budget which was $2.9 billion in 2010, is now a little over $2.5 billion. It's down, not up. This reflects conservative, disciplined budgeting, the type of budgeting Wyoming is known for and proud of. State government has shrunk. It has not grown. The legislature last session voted for $67.7 million in cuts, which I know you found difficult to make. I made three and a half times that amount of cuts in June, which too was very difficult. The belt tightening begun in 2013 has continued, and I make only five general fund requests of you this session. Five million for local governments. We have to continue to support our local governments. 2.5 million for Endow, which I have spoken about. $500,000 for the UOW Science Initiative. 475,000 for the UW Strategic Enrollment Program, and $160,000 for tribal liaisons. These are one-time items, although the Endow Initiative is envisioned for 20 years, and I hope it will continue to be funded beyond this budget cycle. My general fund supplemental budget requests total just over $8.6 million, and the funds are available. For new legislators to put it in perspective, Supplemental budgets in recent history have exceeded $300 million. My budget message explains the importance of these five requests, but today, for example, I'll talk about one of them, the UW Science Initiative. I, as I mentioned earlier, we have been investing in STEM at the University of Wyoming. These efforts are critical. We need to continue to invest in the science initiative, thus the supplemental request. Because we value education, and this legislature values education so strongly, every year I've highlighted the great talent we have with our teachers by recognizing the Teacher of the Year. This year, we're recognizing Ryan Furman, who is Wyoming's 2017 Teacher of the Year. He grew up in Casper. He was inspired by his junior high Latin teacher to become a teacher. He graduated magna cum laude from Black Hills University in Spearfish and received a master's degree out east. A 15-year teaching veteran, Ryan started teaching in Wyoming in 2008 and has taught science at Sheridan Junior High since 2012. In addition to teaching science, he's a VEX robotic instructor, a camp systematic counselor and organizer, science kids board member, and assistant basketball coach. Continued commitment to the science initiative at UW will help prepare more science teachers like Ryan. Ryan, we're very proud of you. Please stand so we may recognize your extraordinary work as a teacher. We know as we consider the difficult work ahead on education that we not only have great teachers, and great school districts, we also in Wyoming have great, great students. Logan Jensen is a junior at University of Wyoming from Grable, Wyoming. I first met Logan when he was an elected official for Boys State and I spent a day with him. Logan is double majoring in physics and astronomy at the University of Wyoming. I did not know that was possible. I'm not even sure it's legal. <laughs> this is an amazing thing. He has taken advantage of almost all Wyoming offers as an undergraduate. As a freshman, he went with faculty to UW's infrared telescope, learning to operate a major scientific facility and acquiring the skills to analyze digital images. 
As a sophomore, he led a study at the atmospheric stability over the Mount Jelm Observatory site. He will participate in next summer's total solar eclipse research and outreach. And for those of you who are not familiar, we are going to have, Wyoming is going to be the place for the total eclipse. This is, if you're not aware, a big deal. And I have, <laughs> and I have here in my notes, in your own words from Diane Schober, make sure everybody knows how valuable this is to tourism. <laughs> it's a big deal. August 21st. He also serves as a counselor to junior high youth at the Exxon Mobil Bernard Harris Summer Science Camp at UW. He's done as a junior what many PhD students would uh, long to do. He's a beneficiary of UW Science Initiative. We want to encourage more students like Logan to take advantage of the UW Science Initiative. Logan, please stand. Congratulations on the extraordinary work you've already done. In this supplemental budget year, I requested contingent funding of $21 million for Title 25 services, $19.2 million to address a failure at the Wyoming State Penitentiary, if necessary, and $104.2 million for the budget reserve account. This contingent funding would come from the LSRA. I also request the legislature authorize bonding to cover capital construction costs for the Wyoming State Penitentiary in Rollins. After talking to some of you, I know some of you are not in favor of that. But let me just say this. Whether you want to do bonding or you want to take it out of savings, it will not go away by not addressing the funding. I believe that the prison should stay in Rollins, not just by the Constitution, but by what it means to that community. I also believe that we need to be prepared to, whether it is a fix or a rebuild, we need to have that addressed this session, including where the funding would come from. My budget proposal is bare bones and balance. We have nearly $1.6 billion sitting in the rainy day fund. It appears without a diversion that I've asked for from all of you, the rainy day fund will grow this session. That's a hard message for the people of Wyoming as we've made in excess of $300 million cuts since last session, and we would continue to grow the rainy day fund and goes again to the question, what is the rainy day fund for and what are we going to use it for? So I have asked for some of that money to be diverted for my budget and to not grow the rainy day fund during a time when we, it is raining. Now I think of, and I know many of you do, think about the general fund budget as a separate budget from education, and I think that's an appropriate way to look at it. The education budget is different. The school foundation program can fund K through 12 school operations through this biennium, but not beyond. Beginning with the 1920 budget, the shortfall in the school foundation program account is projected to be $1.5 billion over the next six years. School facilities and maintenance funding must also be addressed because it's not included in that $1.5 billion. I ask now, as I've asked before, that we work together to discuss solutions that include the public, teachers, school boards, and parents in this discussion. We recognize that one week to submit comments to this body regarding the subcommittee's December 28th very thoughtful education funding white paper is not enough. I believe just short of 600 comments in about a week were provided. We have to make tough decisions this session, but to solve the issue completely, we need to have a broader public discussion. The many public comments we received in one week underscore the need for the public's participation on this issue. Starting the discussion on education, I point out the wonderful report, Superintendent Bailo, we were just rated seventh best in the country. The other six are on the East Coast. We don't even know where the East Coast is in Wyoming. We are proud of that, and we want to continue to be strong in education. I point out Wyoming should be proud of how it supported education. By any measure, Wyoming has placed the highest value on education. To illustrate this point between executive, judicial, and legislative branches, the general fund standard government operating budget has decreased since 2011. In fact, today, the government operations standard budget 
is about $200 million less per biennium than the total block grant to school districts, $200 million less. Simply stated, the standard budget for all government operations is less than we're spending on K through 12 education. This doesn't even include major maintenance, doesn't include school CAPCON construction. In 2016, together, we cut the executive branch operating by 317 million. In total, the cuts to the executive branch were 11% when you combine legislative cuts during the 2016 session and my budget reductions last June. In contrast, the school operation budget has been growing. It was 1.3 billion annually in 2011 when I took office. It is nearly 1.5 billion now, six years later. While student enrollment has increased 12% since 05-06, school foundation funding has increased over 91%. And now we see a projected shortfall of 1.5 billion over the next six years. This is a big problem. It is a fiscal prices, crisis. It is a big problem that requires very big, very difficult choices. As I did last year, I again asked that we have a task force or Speaker Harshman's committee to be formed with full participation of Wyoming stakeholders to address school funding because a year has gone by and things have not gotten better. We cannot wait another year to act. At a minimum, we should be planning for reductions. But there is a broader discussion that we should continue to have about funding and revenue. And it is my hope that participation with all of you and the public that we can at least by the start of next session have a plan that addresses both cuts and the funding. I do want to mention a non-budget measure from last session, the Safe to Tell program authorized by legislation by Senator Coe and Speaker Harshman. I'm pleased to report that this program, which is an anonymous tip line, is already making a difference in preventing suicide and improving school safety. This session, I know you'll be considering numerous bills. I'll follow them as they move through the legislative process. But I can tell you here at the start a few things that I am interested in. I support in concept the sales tax collection from remote sellers, establishment of a legislative <coughs> framework for endow, improving ignition interlock laws, and providing a mechanism to continue the energy and water strategies. In what has sure been a challenging financial market, we're getting poor investment returns. There's just no other way to look at it. It's a challenge in this financial market. But we're also not doing well compared to other states. And yet the state of Wyoming pays in excess of $70 million a year in management fees and consulting fees. This has to change. It has to change now more than ever when we are budget constrained. The treasurer has worked hard in his office to make some suggestions for the legislature. I'd ask you to consider those suggestions because the treasurer like me, like the SLIB, recognizes we want better returns and we want to spend less money in getting those returns. Until we can get a broader, more comprehensive tax structure, I ask you to consider continuing the manufacturing tax exemption, which is, some, which is sunsetting. It's important for the businesses that are here. It's important for some of the businesses we are trying to recruit now. We are looking to the change of administration in D.C. in the coming weeks and we hope that will provide an opportunity for Wyoming to become stronger. I'm heartened about the prospect of fewer federal regulations and pro-growth economic policies. I'm hopeful the new administration will see the benefits of what states like Wyoming have done in responsibly developing our resources. I'm hopeful that more authority will be given to the states with respect to natural resources and other areas. And as we face some difficult budget times, we know that we are, in fact, better suited to address the problem than we ever been, have been in the past. I also am confident that this group, the legislature, is the group to deal with these difficult issues. But as always, it really isn't just about the numbers and the dollars or a single issue. We cannot lose the forest in the trees. This session, as every session, we remain obligated to do what is best not for ourselves, our political parties, but for the citizens of wonderful Wyoming. What a privilege we have to have that as our duty. What a privilege it is to have that opportunity to have our job to serve the citizens of Wyoming without regard to political party, without regard to any single issue,
but how do we do better for the citizens of Wyoming? I thank the legislature as I always do. We are successful in this state for a number of reasons, but a prime reason is we have a citizen legislature to you men and women who give up your time and leave your homes and your families and your businesses to come here. It's an extraordinary thing. It keeps Wyoming strong. But as always, we take time today to say we know we're blessed to live in this state. We say to the citizens of Wyoming, we will continue to work hard for you. We say may God continue to bless Wyoming, the United States, and all her people. Thank you very much. Governor Mead, on behalf of the members of the legislature, I thank you for attending this joint session and thank you for your message, very inspiring. Members of the 64th legislature, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I now present the Honorable E. James Burke, Chief, Justi Chief Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, Governor and Mrs. Meade, members of the 64th Wyoming Legislature, elected officials, members of the judiciary, guests and citizens of the state of Wyoming, it is an honor to speak to you on behalf of the dedicated men and women who serve in the judicial branch of our state's government. Thank you, President Bebout and Speaker Harshman for the opportunity to do so. Congratulations to both of you for the well-deserved elevation to your leadership positions. We also offer our congratulations to all the newly elected and re-elected members of our legislature. There have been changes in our judiciary since we last talked. During the past year, District Judge Jeff Dinell and Circuit Judge Terry Tharp announced their retirements after long and distinguished careers on the bench. They will be missed. Judge Tory Cricken has replaced Judge Dinell in the 2nd Judicial District in Laramie, and Judge Paul Phillips has replaced Judge Tharp in the 6th Judicial District in Gillette. Both are highly qualified. We are pleased to welcome them as colleagues. I'm pleased to point out that both took office on the first day following the retirement of their predecessor. This is another testament to our merit selection process. In Wyoming, we do not have judicial vacancies that linger to the detriment with, of, of those with cases pending in our courts. On a more somber note, we must acknowledge the recent passing of a former county and circuit judge, Don Hall. Judge Hall capably served the citizens of the 9th Judicial District in Riverton for over 22 years before his retirement in 2004. We offer our prayers and condolences to his family and friends. I was in the office this weekend, catching up on some work from last week and preparing for the upcoming events. During a break, I made a visit to our learning center, which is in the first floor of the Supreme Court building. There's a lot of information packed into that location. I find that each time I visit, there's something else that captures my attention. This time, it was the subheading, Shared Power, that is on one of the pillars referencing our three branches of government. The phrase has influenced my remarks to you today. No doubt there are many aspects to the term when describing our three branches, and I do not intend to employ it as a term of art in my remarks today. 
but mutual respect for each branch seems to be inherent in the phrase. An expression of that respect by another branch goes a long way in developing and maintaining the public trust and confidence that is so critical to the judicial branch. I want to highlight three moments from this past year to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. This summer, we hosted the annual conference of chief justices and state court administrators. Nearly every state was represented. The conference was held in Jackson. The weather was perfect, the scenery sublime, and our small but mighty judicial uh, branch administration staff, with spouses pitch and staff attorneys pitching in, pulled it off without a hitch. Special kudos to Rhonda Munger uh, from our court administration, who made all the trains run on time. But for most in attendance, the big takeaway from the, welcome, uh, from the uh, conference were the welcoming remarks of our governor. Governor Meade spoke about the need for a strong judicial branch of government and all that entails. He brought down the House, standing ovation, rave reviews. Some chief justices suggest he run for governor in their state. <laughs> I think he had at least five offers. I thought it was okay. <laughs> the, the positive reaction from all of those chief justices and court administrators, I believe, was in large measure attributable to the conditions in other states where support for the judicial branch pales in comparison to the support we receive here. The governor's remarks were an extension of those he makes at each judicial robing that he attends, and he attends them all more than 20 since he's taken office. And always his remarks are well received and have a positive impact. It's one thing for a judge to tell the public about the need for a strong judicial branch. It is quite another for our citizens to hear that from leaders of the other branches of government. And we are deeply appreciative and many of our colleagues throughout the, throughout the country are envious. We miss, witnessed a similar display this Monday with the grand opening of our Judicial Learning Center. Many of you were in attendance. It was a wonderful event made more special by the remarks of Governor Meade and Speaker Harshman, both of whom expressed their support and recognized the collaborative effort that was essential to the, to the success of the project. For those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to visit the Learning Center, we would encourage you and all members of the public to make sure to, uh, to visit. And I would. It, I think you will enjoy it, and I will leave you with a better appreciation for the rule of law and our system of justice. I would add that this is not just a Cheyenne project. Within a couple of months, the materials developed for the Learning Center will be online and accessible for use in classrooms throughout the state. This project would have never gotten off the ground without the financial support authorized by the legislature. We think your investment will pay huge educational dividends in the years to come. Thank you. Another moment that has stayed with me occurred during the presentation of our supplemental budget uh, to the Joint Appropriations Committee this December. We did not make any requests for additional funding. Instead, we suggested general fund cuts totaling over 1.9 million. As you might expect, there were quite a few questions, some back and forth, but at one point we were asked by Chairman Ross, and I'm paraphrasing, can you afford it? Essentially, he was asking, can you take these cuts and still perform your core mission? <coughs> Will our judicial branch be able to continue to perform as our citizens expect? In light of the difficult times the state is facing financially, the question surprised me but on, upon reflection, it shouldn't have. Over the years, the legislature has taken significant action, even in difficult times, to maintain and strengthen our judicial branch. We have taken to heart your request that we participate in state budget cuts. We want to do our part. The reductions we have proposed are significant and come from a very lean budget. But lean doesn't hack it if you still can't do your mission. While there is some risk, we do not believe that our core mission will be negatively impacted. In this day and age, technology plays an essential role in our ability to fulfill our mission. 
Our administrative office, including the information technology staff, has been working tirelessly to provide functional and reliable systems for statewide court automation, including case management, organizational tools for judges, electronic filing, public access, and jury management. Upon implementation of these various systems, we anticipate that the judicial branch as a whole will become more efficient and productive. Statewide court automation has been the goal of the judicial branch and the legislature for a number of years. While the hope was that full automation of the courts would have been recognized sooner, we are confident that the judicial branch is now on a path that will provide a solid foundation for the statewide rollout of the various systems in an effective and timely manner. We are currently working on updating and transitioning the case management system in both the district and circuit courts statewide. This will result in a uniform <clears throat> approach to case management across general and limited jurisdiction courts in Wyoming. Along with the new case management system, the district court judges will also benefit from electronic tools which will provide them a method to better manage their dockets and individual cases in a manner that conforms to each judge's practices. Additionally, electronic filing will provide attorneys with the convenience of filing documents online and without the necessity of leaving their offices. Public access will provide citizens with the ability to access non-confidential case information from any place that internet access is available. The road to statewide court automation has not been smooth. Frankly, we expected that these systems will be in place before this time. During this past year, we became convinced that a change in vendors was necessary if we were going to get where we wanted to go. We have hired a new vendor and have embarked on an ambitious schedule to move forward with these projects. The current case management system will remain in place during transition to the new system. Rollout of the system will begin in June of 2018. E-filing will follow in 2019. And we anticipate that the entire project will be completed in 2020 and that will have been worth the wait. Again, I want to thank you, the district court clerks for their patient cooperation and support as, work, as we've worked through these issues. We also commend this body for its foresight and leadership making this investment to improve the delivery of judicial services to our citizens. Adequate, <clears throat> adequate technology in the courtroom is also an essential ingredient in a properly functioning judicial branch. This past year, we commissioned a study of the audio and visual technology in all 69 of our courtrooms in order to get a handle on the situation. The results were disturbing. Many of our courtrooms lack basic audio enhancement features and have no video equipment. As one judge put it, Abraham Lincoln would be perfectly at home in my courtroom. <laughs> we must do better, and that brings me to another aspect of shared power or perhaps shared responsibility. There's no serious dispute that there should be appropriate technology in all of our courtrooms. There is, however, a difference of opinion about responsibility for the purchase, installation, and maintenance of that equipment. Are the counties responsible? Or is the state through the judiciary? Reasonable minds can differ. Pertinent legislation does not specifically define responsibility for courtroom technology. Last year, I spoke at length about technology improvements in the courtrooms in Pinedale. The county paid for all of those improvements. This year, it's necessary to discuss the flip side of the courtroom technology <clears throat> story. And again, I'm going to use specific examples. The courtrooms in Detrona County are some of the newest in this state. They are at the upper echelon in terms of technology. The equipment was purchased by the county. There is a county IT department. This past year, a major piece of equipment failed in one of the courtrooms. Berta Hartford, a judicial assistant for one of the judges, attempted to get the problem rectified. She initially contacted the county, and then she contacted the Supreme Court IT uh, department. When she received no immediate commitment to fix the problem, she sent an email to both the county and our IT department. Here's what she said. On October 11, 2016, county maintenance requested a meeting with the Natrona County Commissioners
to discuss issues with courtroom technology at the Natrona County Townsend Justice Center. They expressed a desire to have a meeting on the following day. To my knowledge, a meeting has not yet been scheduled. It occurred to me that the request did not articulate the pressing nature of these repairs. Three of the four district courtrooms in the Natrona County Townsend Justice Center have critical technology issues which must be immediately addressed. In Judge Forgey's courtroom, 1A, there's a fan in the equipment closet which is burning out. If it quits, there's a danger of the equipment becoming too hot and burning out, possibly frying the entire rack. The AV2 for Judge Wilkins' courtroom is bad, rendering all of the technology in her courtroom useless. County IT was to, able to install a telephone, but it is not attached to the sound system, causing this Band-Aid fix to possibly be of no use during hearings. Judge Wilking was required to move the sentencing for a gentleman in custody and convicted of aggravated assault and battery to Judge Sullen's courtroom so that the state could play a video from the scene of the crime, which the defendant insisted on being played for the court prior to sentencing. She, had to reschedule, she has had to reschedule hearings with parties participating by telephone. The projector, screen, and monitors are relied, upon, are relied upon attorneys in criminal cases to replay confessions and show footage of the crime and crime scene. The system is also used in civil matters to play video depositions, display photographs, and exhibits. The monitors enable the judge, counsel, jury, witness, and audience to easily view the display. The ELO monitor allows a witness to make notations on a picture or exhibit that will appear on all the monitors without leaving the witness stand. The volume on the microphones cannot be turned up, turned down, or muted. The white noise feature cannot be used. It prevents the jury from overhearing bench conferences while allowing the judge and counsel to be audible to the court reporter and each other. The ability to participate tele by telephone is a feature that is used daily and enables our out-of-town counsel, including the Attorney General's office, uh, and other state agencies to avoid traveling to Casper for short hearings, allows correctional institutions, the state hospital, treatment facilities to call instead of transporting the party for the hearing, and prevents councils and parties from driving in inclement weather. I love this email. It's compelling. In a few paragraphs, Ms. Hartford perfectly captures the benefits of courtroom technology, the significant consequences resulting from failure of that equipment, and the frustration that comes when there is no clear path to resolution of the problem. Ultimately, the problem was fixed with funds from the judicial branch. Tim Knight is the IT director for Sweetwater County. He's involved with the construction of the new Justice Center in Sweetwater County, which is on track for completion in December of this year. He is concerned that there is no agreement in place for maintenance of the technology equipment to be installed in the new courtrooms. He is endeavoring to take a proactive approach to avoid the situation that I just described. He offered his perspective in a recent email to our IT department. The problem with no agreement in place is that there are several gaps in defining responsibility for costs that come up in regards to supporting this system. I do not believe that the state technology group gets to absolve itself from their statutory responsibility of supporting the operations of the courts and without an agreement in place. The Board of County Commissioners never formally accepted financial responsibility for the maintenance of the equipment. This might lead to a situation where the courts are not able to function and the state and county are in disagreement as to whose responsibility it is to fix the problem. I'm also concerned that we would be installing a system that the state is not able to support because there is a different platform than they were set up for. There is an economy of scale in supporting a large common network rather than supporting a group of disparate systems, and the state would be better served with a common platform in all of the courtrooms. This appears to be a philosophy shared by the state as I hired a consultant to do an analysis of the courtrooms and come up with recommendations as to what they should be putting in these courtrooms. There are also several counties that do not have IT support, and it would not be fair to expect different levels of service from the state based on which county you work in. Given all of this, I recognize that there are significant shortfalls in revenues in all areas of government, and there are limited resources to be had in supporting courtroom technology. 
Knowing that those shortfalls exist, Sweetwater County IT staff have been willing to assist in troubleshooting issues, replacing defective equipment, or setting up systems from time to time in order to compensate for the distances that separate the state IT staff from the courtrooms. This is done with a cooperative spirit without any discussion of remuneration, and I believe that this relationship will continue as long as I am the IT director. Mr. Knight asks, so how do we move forward? The suggestions, number one, the county and state should work to ensure that the equipment installed at the new facility is in alignment with the state courtroom plan. The state should work on ways to increase funding to the court technology group so that they have adequate resources to support the courtroom technology throughout, through the state. The county and state could work out an agreement that is satisfactory to each other regarding ongoing support of these systems. He concludes, I really hope that the legislature makes it possible for the state technology group to do its job and make this a model facility that can be repl replicated throughout the state. We agree with Mr. Knight. Appropriate technology should be in place in all of our state courtrooms. The quality of presentations and the ability to hear what is going on in our public courtrooms should not depend on the county in which the case is tried. Economies of scale dictate that the equipment be uniform so that it can be purchased installed and maintained in the most cost-effective manner possible. The state and the counties must continue to work together, but in every county, for every courtroom, there must be a clear understanding of responsibility. Funding must be adequate and sustainable. These are not new issues. The back and forth between the state and the county has been around for a long time, but is seriously and negatively impacting our ability to make progress. It is time that those issues were addressed. We recognize that there may be different viewpoints as, how to, as to how responsibility should be apportioned and that all stakeholders should have an opportunity to weigh in. Perhaps it is an appropriate interim topic. But there is no question that our courtrooms do not have adequate technology and that additional funding is required. Senator Perkins and Representative Nicholas are sponsoring legislation this ses session to address the funding issue. The proposed legislation increases the court automation fees by $10. Those fees have been in place since the judicial system's automation account was established in 2000. Even with the increase, our court fees are substantially below those charged in other states. The technology burdens on the judicial branch have increased exponentially since that time. We would urge your support of that legislation. And before closing, there is one other piece of pending legislation that I would like to discuss and it involves our circuit judges. Our circuit court judges are the unsung heroes of our judiciary. They are on the front lines handling a high volume of cases and are essentially on call 24-7. They are the ones that get called in the middle of the night for search warrants. They operate under strict deadlines in a large percentage of their cases. Bond hearings must be set within 20 hours, 72 hours of arrest. Protection orders must be held within 72 hours uh, of request. They're required to have quick settings for eviction proceedings, must determine probable cause for felonies within 10 days of arrest if the alleged felon is incarcerated. We continually ask more from our circuit judges. In 2011, civil jurisdiction in circuit court was increased from $7,000 to $50,000. This has led to more contested civil hearings and trials. The legal issues presented in those cases can be as complicated as those presented in district court. The circuit judges, however, must address those issues without any assistance from a law clerk, or in many cases, from an attorney for any party, because of a, lar in a large portion of their caseload involves pro se litigants. On top of that, they're also tasked with the administrative oversight of daily office operations, including personnel. I could go on. Historically, there has been an informal judicial salary structure in place where the circuit judges receive somewhere between $15,000 and $20,000 less in annual salary than district judges. That changed in 2012 when the legislature approved a significant pay raise to bring the judiciary in line with salaries for employees of other branches. Salaries for Supreme Court justices and court judges and district court judges were set in line with the recommendations of the Board of Judicial Policy. Inexplicably, at least from our perspective, the salary for circuit court judges 
was set at $119,000, which is well below the $132,000 recommendation. The new salary structure created a $31,000 gap between district and circuit court judges. There have been no judicial raises in the past five years, so the gap continues. Senator Christensen and Representative Miller are co-sponsoring legislation to correct that inequity. The Board of Judicial Policy has unanimously reiterated the re recommendation it made five years ago, and we would urge your support of that legislation. We recognize that there are many as other aspects of state government, many other considerations that you must take into account in reaching your decisions. We know that it is a heavy responsibility, but we have every confidence that you are up to the challenge. During my remarks, I've emphasized the concept of shared power or shared responsibility. I did so because I think it's important to recognize how fortunate we are in this state. The mutual respect that exists among our branches does not exist everywhere. Yes, there is a constitutional separation of power, but there is also cooperation and communication. We are better for that, and ultimately, that benefits our citizens. We wish you well in this legislative session as you grapple with the important issues facing our state. <clears throat> Thank you again for the opportunity to visit with you this morning. Good luck and Godspeed. Thank you. Chief Justice Burke, on behalf of the members of the legislature, I thank you for attending this joint session and thank you very much for your message. We appreciate that. Senator Perkins and Representative Miller and Burkhart, will you please escort the First Lady of Wyoming and the Governor from the Chamber? Senator Christensen and Representative Greer and Biteman, will you please escort the Chief Justice from the Chamber?